Odd. So welcome to everybody listening now and in the future. Um, this is prenatal and perinatal healing happens in layers, a primer for professionals and clients. And it's an overview. It's an introduction to the maps that I'm going to be talking about. It's actually an introduction to the work that I teach and train. And it's a chance for me to sort of wet your whistle, so to speak, but also um, give you a sense of how I work and what I feel like after being in the field as long as I have for almost 30 years now. Um, what I feel like are the skills necessary to work uh, healing earliest layers of experience. So I'm going to go ahead and you know share my slideshow. Feel free to ask questions, put questions in the chat. I'm hoping to have time for questions at the end. And for you all that are here live with me, I am recording to the cloud. Um, if you if you want to share, just know you're going to be a part of our recording. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and share. Okay. So, um, yeah, like I said, I can see a lot of you now. Like, there's a lot of you come on the call now. I can't see everyone, but I can see you. So, if you want to raise your hand or if you have a question, please do. Now, um, for those of you who don't know me, um, I'm I'm a I'm maternal and child health specialist, but I'm also a body worker. I'm a somatic therapist. I've trained for many years in understanding the earliest layers of experience. So I am a registered biodynamic cranial psychotherapist, a somatic experiencing practitioner. I have um, many trainings with the Chitties. They are one of my primary influences, which I'm going to go ahead and explain to you a little bit my influences so you know what my background is. Um, but I have now combined quite a few things so that um, I can, I'm teaching and now creating practitioners who want to work with earliest layers of experience, mostly as prevention and treatment right away. But we're also developing programs for practitioners that want to learn to work with adults. Um, but I do have a very specific lineage that I want to talk about because I do feel like the work I do, it comes through somatics. It comes through understanding the body. <clears throat> and it's not a it's a, not a top-down cognitive thing. It's, it's something to do with how we feel in our bodies. So this is to orient you. This is the layout of my talk tonight. I want to introduce to you the layers of experience and, and go over some fundamental important themes. <clears throat> now, I don't know all of you are training. Some of you may have somatic training. Some of you may are coming to this through through birth, through uh, midwifery or through attending births or working with babies. Some of you may be therapists that work with adults. Like a lot of times I get therapists that come that are really wanting to understand now this early time, which is so satisfying for me, having been in the field now since 1999. And I'm thrilled that there's so much interest and actually so much data and so much evidence. Um, we, don't, we don't need any more research. We just need now practitioners who understand and ways to understand what it is we're actually seeing and, under, and experiencing. So I want to talk about the themes and I want to talk about the skills. And then I'll I'll tell you about the maps that I'm going to be presenting. There's three distinct maps that I've developed. And if you purchase the online course, which is not expensive and it's there for you, it's $75 for three of the lectures, you get access to the maps and, uh, and the recordings and the handouts. So just please make sure your microphones are muted. Um, thank you. Okay, so this is my lineage. And um, I think it's important for you to know sort of how, what, what comes through me. And in fact, yeah, Vonderwall, your Three picture should be up there. Um, and so 
Yeah, I wanted just to make sure that you knew, yeah, you were very formative um, for me also. But um, Anna and John Chitty are my primary influences. I, I work a lot with the biodynamic cranial psychotherapy and on understanding how we are in our bodies, how we feel in our bodies. But I'm also trained uh, by Jim File. He's um, an, a student of Dr. Randolph Stone, who his, his polarity and understanding our body and how we shape and are shaped in our body. Um, this is his works very much influenced by Stanley Kellerman, but he was originally trained by Randolph Stone, which um, uh, he's an amazing human who, who brought together East and West and, and energy medicine in our bodies. Randolph Stone was also a midwife, which is some of the things I like about Randolph Stone. He's a very uh, multidisciplinary human passed away long ago. Um, I'm also trained in somatic experiencing. For those of you who are SE trained, you can recognize some of the legacy teachers there for Peter uh, Levine. The line on the bottom are all the, the influences I've had in pre and perineal psychology. And in the corner is Lois Trezice and she and I, she's a midwife now 40 years, and she and I have co-created this um, training that we do which brings together the midwifery model of care, uh, somatic trauma resolution, and understanding the baby's experience. So um, these people, Ray and Anna and John Chitty, they have really helped, they form the basis for how I teach and what I teach, along with Randolph Stone um, and understanding the embryo. This is Anna Chitty. Okay. So over the last 30 years, and actually in the last just few years, we've really been able to put words to the early layers of experience. And I find that this is you know, pre prenatal and perinatal somatics, really understanding that there are distinct layers of experience that come, and we can track that now. Um, mostly thanks to the pioneers in pre and perinatal or birth psychology, but also Ray Castellino, who was a, um, a, a major influence and, and learned through William Emerson and other pre and perinatal specialists, but really being able to lay down understanding that we develop in layers, we develop in a sequence. And he and Anna Chitty um, and the field of birth psychology, I feel like these are the the building blocks, the layer, early layers, the, the fundamentals. But we can now begin to go in and recognize what are those things that happened to us even before we got here, even in preconception through the ancestors, through our epigenetics. And all this has come about over just over the last five to 10 years, we do have a deeper understanding of, of how we are shaped, how we shape ourselves, and also how what are those influences on us that we that inform the ground or the template or the basis um, for our early life? And upon that, we grow, right? So I'm fond of saying that pre and perinatal healing employs a somatic pattern language. As practitioners, you, we we teach you and you learn how to identify what is the story unfolding before you? And it, it shows up in posture, like in shape. It shows up in our physiology. We can see it in our bodies. It shows up in sensation, which I'm gonna talk more about today. It shows up as movement and gesture, uh, you know, how we hold our head, how we move our head, how we move our bodies, what our bodies are saying from our earliest experiences and how we, how we developed in utero even, can show up in our bodies as children and adults. How we speak, what are our metaphors? For example, I used to, word, used, used to use the word struggle a lot. I don't use it so much anymore. Um, I, I do think I struggled quite a bit uh, in my intrauterine life at the very end of my, of my prenatal time. Struggle, um, it, you know, is, is a 
metaphor for my early experience. And if you listen to people, I often will share through ways that they perceive and see their lives. You're listening through that lens. And then the quality of presence. That I think is the major skill that helps people in understanding okay, that there's, an, there's a level of survival energy that can often come with the earliest layers of experience. And so what we're, when you sit in my seat, when you sit as practitioner, you get to know what these early layers feel like and you can, it doesn't push you off your center. You can feel them through your own presence and it's the quality of your presence that makes the difference for your person that you're working with. And then there's also your own body empathy, like your body is a tool and it feels and those are the things that we teach in the trainings that your body can feel and sense into what's happening for people in the states that they feel. And, you know, just like a puzzler or any kind of, you know, story searcher or, you know, detective, you can start to pull together a lot of the details from what someone knows because often they don't know. And you can help them integrate their early layers of experience. Integration is what people are seeking. That's why they're coming to you. Um, they want, they often people will seek me out because nothing else seems to have helped. All the talk therapy, all the psychotherapy, all the things that they've tried, not, they are still in being influenced by the patterns that are affecting them. Uh, so we, we call this notion the integration imperative. It comes from my friend Mark Brady. And he says that he, healing wants to happen. It's, you know, Peter Levine talks about it as well, as well as, you know, William Emerson, our pioneers in pre perineal psychology, that the stories want to land. They want to be seen. They, they want somehow resolution. And they repeat and repeat and repeat. So, my passion is to catch these stories very early, to prevent and treat them right away, um, working with birth trauma, working with the baby's experience. Um, that will prevent a lot of the stories from repeating. And the stories can repeat in such a way that then they become another layer. And by the time somebody comes to you as the adult, the story has repeated and then there's other there's other like inherent places in the body and in the life of the person that are organizing them. So it can take longer to heal. That's why I'm really passionate about working with babies, working with families, working with uh, helping them understand what happened to them. So I can, so they can integrate. And sometimes it takes just one session for a family to integrate. So we're working with layers of experience. This is a, this is a, an image from Ray Castellino who talks about them as continu a continuum of circles. We start from source. We come from the invisible world, the spiritual world, into matter. And we come into matter. And from there, our soul is born there. And then there's self, our twin dynamic, um, or multiples, or finding out more and more of us come in as triplets. Um, then our family, extended family, village, city, country, state, and so continent and the whole planet, our solar system. These are all influences. So the very early time, as we come into form, um, we come into form with, inside our parent. And that I love studying the, the embryo because the embryo is sovereign in there. The embryo does a lot. Embryo creates their own world, their own their body, but their own placenta, their own amnion, their own yolk sac, and their own little womb within the womb. They have a sovereignty there. And you can really build a lot by coming back and getting in touch with your embryo. I have done that and 
it totally changes how you feel in your body and how you are in the world. Um, so I, I advocate a lot for understanding how we come into form in our own embryo. But then, you know, if we've had a, a major event in, in utero, it does show up. It can, be, it can lie in the mysterious places, like in a twin dynamic or something else um, in the uterus. Um, often there are mysteries in there. And families do bring their children to me and ask me, like, what, what happened? You know, sometimes we don't really know. And what I say to parents is that oftentimes when we're working with these mysteries, because it's not a story that we know in our brain. It's not that we can lay out the details in a chronological way. We just know something happened. And it's usually a big thing, a scary thing. Um, I say to parents, let's, let's, let's work at it like we're tumbling a lock, like we're trying to crack a safe. We tumble one way until it clicks. We tumble the other way until it clicks. And usually we can find enough clues. And if you're with a person who knows, we can start to put the story together. Um, but slowly, you know, sometimes we don't really need to know all the things. We just need to meet that person where they are with their story. And that is what I train you to do. Um, and that's what I do with families and with babies. But babies are quite different to work with, by the way. They're not, they're a lot different than children or adults. Um, I can talk more about that later. So if any of you really want to know, I find them direct. I find them easy to work with. Um, I find them delight, really delighted often and just full of joy. And so able to, once they get it, that I get it. And they can tell me the story. It's pretty amazing, actually. Babies are very are all the things that John Chitty taught them about about me about them to me. That they're sentient and perceptive, super sentient, super perceptive. He called them the royalty of humanity, and and I agree. They are the best of us. So we are shaped. Uh, we are shaped by forces that we come into relationship with. And even though, you know, like Yab said at the beginning when he said, no, no, we shape, we do, we make our body. We make our body as embryo. We make our body. And we make, like I said, our whole yolk sac and the, our protection and our placenta. We do so much. But we're also influenced by other things. We're influenced by our mother, our mother and her experience. We're influenced by the ancestors. We're influenced by um, our family dynamic. And often I find this, this is what I work with with adults, is this long-term formative sequence that has a logic of its own. That's a quote from Jim File. We are shaped by these continual input from family and from society and culture and we think that that's us but really it's it's how we are formed and when you come into relationship with that when you can bring your consciousness to that um, then that's the whole idea behind the work that I do with adults is you want to make what happened more conscious and sometimes you need to do it in small little pieces, what doable pieces or little drops so that someone can slowly understand that I was formed in this way and then create a, a chance for them to bring choice to how they want to be in the world. And what I often will say to someone is like, what do you want for yourself? What do you want for yourself here on planet Earth with the time that you have left being this this soul here now? What do you want for yourself? And I work and align myself with that. And I help you. I help you get that. So we're shaped. And back when I was working for APA, I had talked about this a lot. Like when I was there was when the transgenerational data was really accepted. And we knew, yes, that 
or things that came before us really influenced us. Um, and then we also knew that our early childhood also influenced us. It makes sense, doesn't it, that our womb experience influences us. This is a quote from David Chamberlain. A womb is a schoolroom and every baby attends. We work then to understand this vital part of our human development. Um, we make our body in relationship with our birthing parent. We work with more senses than twelve than five. There are 12. And then we work again with the babies that have experiences in utero with learning and emotion. We learn a lot there. We learn language. We learn about the world. We learn about our what our parent is going through. Sometimes we think it's about us if there's nobody there differentiating for us. So that the mothers or the birthing parents' experiences, they influence how we create our brain and our body. And this is a big deal now because we're understanding that the inflammation that a parent experiences can heavily influence how a baby makes their body and feels in their body. So the, a lot of the fetal brain researchers, which is I have a great passion for the fetal brain research, is that... <clears throat> if we can really help now um, how a parent is feeling, it can really influence the neurodevelopment of a child. What a parent experiences sometimes leaves neurodevelopmental markers in a baby so that later they will express, not just when they emerge, when they're a young adult or when they're even in their 20s. Um, are the disorganized experiences from these early times will begin to show up as we make transitions into adulthood. And I know that's confusing because of, you know, why would, would it wait? But this is what we're finding in the fetal brain research is that mental illness, especially heavy mental illness, can start in utero. That's why this is such a vital neurodevelopmental time and why I want to bring more attention and skills for practitioners to work with it. Prevention and treatment right away. So we want to be able to recognize when we're having a memory related to our earliest experiences. And you can make somebody's life so much easier by saying, oh, well, this, this comes from this. Or these are the early things that may have happened here. And, and someone may look at you and say, you mean there's a name for it? Yes. You know, there, there are these early experiences that we can have. And if you begin to map it out for someone, name the layers, slow the pace, have the person feel reflected, then many things settle. Many things begin to integrate even then. So when I've worked with pre and perinatal psychology, people think, oh, well, this is psychology. This is mental health. But it really, it's not. It's more than that. It's a holistic body-mind practice where implicit somatic memory is alive and active and actually informing how we behave and choices that we make in the present. We know now the body remembers, which is, I mean, it's so wonderful to have been a practitioner all these years and have it be accepted. The body, the body has a memory and it remembers way back to even being in the womb. Actually, mem the memories that we can sometimes express come from our ancestors. Like sometimes the more I sit with people, sitting with family stories and that people are in them they don't see them they just feel them so these implicit body sensations create an experience and our mind tries to make sense of it it makes a story up about it so when the pattern is recognized and the nervous system response included in the awareness of the person you're working with that things begin to settle and healing begins to happen and it happens from the inside out, from the person sitting in front of you. I mean, you you 
are able to be with them in such a way that they begin to put the pieces together. And your level of presence and inquiry, how you help them make sense of it, that's when, when the healing happens. So I get this question. I used to get this question a lot. Like, why is it called PPN then? What, 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 why is it called PPN? And I just wanted to put this in here so that people can get a sense of the history. Like pioneering practitioners called it all kinds of things. It was called primal therapy. It was called primal psychology. It was called rebirthing. Maybe some of us on the call here tonight are old enough to remember. But nothing really stuck. Nothing really stuck long enough for it to feel like, oh, this is what it is. Some, some folks call it birth psychology, but it's much more than birth. Um, so pre and perinatal psychology, it, it could be PPP, which sometimes you'll hear that, especially in Europe. But it, I call it PPN, and I think that that's what really has stuck. PPN, pre and perinatal somatic psychology. And the way to understanding some of the patterns is through understanding sensation in the body and how we make meaning of that. And, and now we're gotten very fluent about that and in, in understanding that through trauma therapy, somatic therapy, through the polyvagal theory, through understanding that our our bodies are these vibrating networks that are that have information. So as practitioner, we need to come become fluent in in working with sensation, working with the way that our our body feels and moves and senses. So the body remembers. This is one of my favorite quotes from Peter Levine, who is the creator of somatic experiencing. And this is from his last book, Trauma and Memory. Um, implicit memories are hot. They are powerfully compelling. So remember what I said about, about the earliest layers of experience. It often has, has a lot of survival energy to it. It can... There can be life threat, early life threat. There can be fear and terror in the baby's body from things that they experience. Um, so they arise as a collage of sensations, emotions, and behaviors. So they rise quickly, and they're layered on top of each other. So I like this quote because this I think there's this is the truth of it. Sometimes we'll encounter conditions that remind us of these early layers and they come quickly into our body. Our body registers it. We have sensation. We have response. And then our mind is left thinking, what is this? Like, I have to make a memory of this. There's something here. And they, there's a meaning or a story that they start to spin. Often it's, I'm bad. I'm wrong. I did something wrong. You know, I don't belong. Like that that's common, especially babies that have had medically complex issues and nobody talked to them about it. Or they've had major losses and nobody said anything to them about it. Because they don't, baby, didn't think babies had consciousness. But babies are, like I said, super sentient. And so I talk with them, I talk with them and name things for them so that they can understand that this is not about them. So one of the biggest questions that we unconsciously and consciously ask all the time, naturally in our bodies is, am I safe? So your body is constantly seeking. Your anatomy is out there um, in its neuroception, like looking, trying to say, where's the danger and where's the safety? So we in our education now we know a lot in our psychoeducation understanding the different states that we get into connected to survival but also to connection uh, we, we call that social engagement so this comes from the polyvagal theory understanding that we have these layers of of states that are connected to how we feel in relationship or in our daily lives on um, how we mobilize to get things done, how we rest, 
Well, sometimes when we get overwhelmed, we can get go into fight, flight, or freeze. We have our own tendencies, and that is part of working with trauma, but also it's just being human. Uh, so we've been able to get very granulated, very specific about understanding our nervous system responses. And then when you have trauma, which can be confusing, um, trauma creates patterns of adaptive responses. We grow um, in relationship with what happens to us. So we can grow like a rock, we can uh, like a tree around a rock. We can grow toward the light. We can find our way. We have adaptive sequences that we go through. So these therapies that we study are all, there's so many ways to work with that and help us become more aware of what has happened to us. So when we're working with earliest layers of experience, we're working with a non a pre-verbal time. So it's 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 sensation, it's movement, it's proprioception, it's how we are in our bodies. So babies experience all these states. They're not immune uh, to being a human in response to what's overwhelming or what's regulating or what's comforting or what's exciting. Babies have all those. And so this is where the expertise of understanding the early layers comes in. Like we know we can now get very specific about the layers of experience on us, even on a cellular level. So as adults, we can have spontaneous memories of the, these states, and that's when it gets confusing. Like when, when conditions in the present will trigger these deep implicit memories. How we feel in our bodies impacts us. So our state will drive a story. And this is uh, just a slide about the interoception, how our bodies are hardwired, all of our organs, and then how we make sense of it in our bodies. So what I do first is I can, you'll see in the maps that I've created, I help us understand the states. Many of you are already fluent in these states, but many are not, especially in those who have not studied how to work with autonomic nervous system stress and threat responses. So a big part of coming to understand early experiences is just becoming more fluent in these states, which are natural and normal human responses to our daily life and to things that happen to us. So these are some of the sayings that I know you all know so well, hopefully these days. The body bears the burden. This is Bob Scar. He was one of the first ones I read. He was one of the first ones that wrote books about how the body has a, has memory. Then the body remembers, which is Babette Rothschild. And then the famous body keeps the score now by Bessel van der Kolk. And the, it starts in us before conception with our parents. And sometimes when I'm sitting with a person, I can ask them, hey, this feels like it came from your family line. Often we know that a baby is an egg inside their mother, inside their grandmother. So you can begin to feel through the ancestors that will show up in the present. And then I've added this, we are and we. This is Dan Siegel. And um, I like that because we, like I said, are shaped by our relationships and we are natural in connection with relationships. We're hardwired to connect. So in tracking trauma responses, you begin to become fluent with states and we all have ways we respond to life. And this is where, when we're trying to fit ourselves into how people describe autonomic nervous system stress and threat responses and what does health feel like and what does stress feel like and what does threat feel like. Some of us have greater capacities for threat and stress. Other people don't. So you want to be specific you know, with your person, get to know who's sitting in, across from you and what helps what helps them. And some of us are slower and some of us are faster and 
some of us are more sensitive, others are more resilient, and some of us are more intense and others more relaxed. And when, when people bring their children to me and to say, is this their personality or is this something that happened? I mean, it's not, it's a mix of things. And so really helping, helping people understand themselves from the inside out is really a part of the therapy. And it's part of what Ray Castellino was really good at. I mean, really understanding yourself and help helping your person that you're helping connect those dots and, and know that health can show up as a range, not just one thing. So we're tracking. <clears throat> this is one of our big skills is nervous system tracking. I'm speeding up slowing down, uh, working with historical responses. Like I said, <clears throat> sometimes we're influenced by our family, which is a long-term formative sequence. And it can be coupled with sensation and run in the background. In other words, so often we're, we brace. We don't even know we're bracing. And we spend our life in the brace. Or maybe we're collapsed and we spend our life that way. We think that's us when it's really a natural normal response to something that happened early, maybe even before we came. So there's fundamental important themes when we're working to understand how to work with early life. And these are ones that I've just isolated because they're important to, to me when I work, but also when I'm training people how to work with this early life. The first one is coherence. Second one is stabilization. The third one, third one is inquiry and facilitation. And then recognition of early experience. And then memory, presence, and shifting states. So before I go into our important themes, I'm just going to stop here, make a little eye contact, and just see if there are any questions. Are you all good? Yeah, thank you for the thumbs up. <laughs> okay. All right. So in Ray Castellino, when we um, went into COVID and we couldn't do womb surrounds in person, he developed a way of making eye contact, um, uh, making sure that people knew that he was making eye contact. And so he would just do this little hand gesture across the screen. And it's just a way of saying, I want some eye contact. And it's just a nice little way of saying, hey, that I see you, see me. And, you know, when I'm, sometimes when I'm working with babies, I'll, I'll, I don't know how many of you work with babies. How many of you work with babies here? A few, Marie, Heather, Lara, Catherine, you know how what they do, they look at you, they just look and look and look and look and look and look and look. They don't look away, they just look. And I say to them, I see you, I see you, I see you seeing me. And I say, you can look, you can look all you want. And you can feel them going in there and looking around, seeing if you're a good person or not, you know. They just fearless like that. Uh, Allison, your question, what was Jim's phrase? That's one of my favorite phrases of Jim's. Um, we have a long-term formative sequence that has a, its own logic. So often when I'm working with people, this, there's a family dynamic at play. And that family dynamic has, has influenced that nervous system over many years maybe their whole life. So it's it's a long-term formative sequence. It's not shock, right? Even though there are probably some shocking things in there. Um, and it, it happens over a long period of time. So it's like you all have heard the whole saying that the body's like a mountain. And it's influenced by the weather and by the wind and, and by you know, by things that happen 
by rain, by water. So, so is it with us. We are formed, we are shaped by these influences. And when we try to change our shape, sometimes the flu those influence will try and keep you from changing your shape. But I tell you what, once you start changing your shape, sometimes the whole family dynamic changes. It's, it's really interesting. Okay, I'm going to go back and start the next phase of our presentation. Okay. Okay, so these are the themes that I've isolated. These are things that I like to teach. And these first two are all about safety. Now, I've often heard that um, coherency is also coupled with resonance. And the resonance that you are crafting is between you and the person sitting across from you. Or in my case, it's with the whole family, see. It's with the, the parents and the baby. And it's my job to bring everybody into a resonant state together. And sometimes I have whole families, like I'll have I'll have the child, the first child, or the first and second child, um, and the baby, and the parents. Sometimes I'll have five people in my office seat. So my job is to bring people into resonance, and it's my body and my presence and my knowing of how to bring people there. And I start with creating coherency. So this is from the heart, this image is from the heart math. They're actually very good at defining coherency and creating methods for bringing it about, usually through breath and, and through slowing down and, in, and using positive emotion. But coherency is a state of flow. And these are positive states like happiness, gratitude, generosity, compassion, you know, connecting with caring to tend and befriend, which is the word of the polyvagal theory, having kindness, someone's kind to us. Um, and then how we are together. Like, well, that could be, all these things can make a huge difference when someone is kind, um, then that there can create this coherency. When we're kind to ourselves, it creates coherency within. So when we're working, we try to help somebody come into a resonant state with a coherency within themselves. Um, this is what we call the blueprint. And it's anything that connects us more to ourselves, to our health. What, what's good? What's good about our lives? It can be something very simple, um, like your favorite coffee cup, you know, like that feeling in your hand or your favorite pair of shoes or brushing your hair. Um, often people will say it's it's as it's nature. Nature is is creates a sense of ease and joy. Going for a walk, you know, my animals, my pets, my my best friend. There are these things that that help us feel that coherent state. Appreciation and gratitude, slowing down warmth and then feeling that flow so you're when we're bringing someone into a coherent state one of our inquiries would be well what's happening in your body how do you feel now and there's a, a level of usually warmth and spreading expansion or sometimes people feel both heavy and light at the same time so i'm tracking these feelings and i'm helping reflect back to someone this is a state of health in your body so helping people get it. Oh, well, this is this is what embodiment feels like. This is what health feels like. This is a state of balance in my body. And you often have to reflect that back to people because often they don't know. And it can be a very empowering to have somebody notice how it is for them and what helps them get into a more coherent state. Helping someone come into relationship with what goes on around them. 
So this is what we call the fields in our work. Um, and we help people understand that what's around us also influences us. And we can begin to read that. So in the heart math and invariably in the work that we teach as well, we teach that there is this field around us. We have a field of energy that we can measure. And they can measure it around the heart and they can measure it around our bodies. And one body will influence another, which is the good news and the bad news. But when they come into relationship with you, it's your job to start to create that resonant field. And therefore your own body has to be in a resonance, you know, a, a good sort of clear resonant space. Or you can manage it in a good way because you've been trained. It's a torus. It's that continual, slow-moving shape. That's the basis for much of, of living things um, from on a cellular level and on a physical level and on a planetary level. These are the things that influence our work. We understand that we that there is a flow that's and we're constantly in motion. So this is the early pattern. This is the pattern of the blueprint. And when you're working with someone, it can show up in their gestures, how they use their hands bilaterally. It can show up in how they describe how they feel. This expansion that widens and then it gathers and it rises and falls. And I'm listening for that. And I'm resonating with that inside myself. And you're creating a coherent sort of feeling between the two of you and you're creating a good sense of feeling in the present, in the now, a positive state. You create a coherent state. Again, this is from heart math. They've been able to document well how positive emotions create these very wonderful, long, smooth sine waves, whereas more negative emotions create more jagged waves. So you're working to create coherency, which is here connection and consistency, integration of diverse elements, a feeling of wholeness. And that comes about if you sit with someone and you drop them in, help them drop and from their own experience from the inside out, what helps them feel more coherent. Sometimes people will, will think cohesiveness is coherency. And cohesiveness is just holding it all together. It is actually a form of bracing. And many of us have it. Many of us brace against it because it's a memory. It truly, and we all, a lot of us have memories of it. Or we have a life that's stressful and we're bracing. Like one of the exercises I'll give to people is what happens at, at night when you lie down? Are you able to really let the table or the, the bed hold you? Let your body really be held by the bed. So it, you know, it can it can influence our perception and it influences how we feel in our body. And when it's an incoherent state, it can feel, you know, jagged and rough and disorganized. And that's what people bring. They want help with that. This is a famous sort of little map from Heart Math. Again, showing this is actually measured through heart, the heart, heart wave, the heart, very, the heart rate variability of the space between heartbeats. And when you can get somebody into an appreciative state that has this wonderful long sine wave, regular, and if someone is in an incoherent state, it can have that jagged line. So we use the present moment and with presence, help someone to come into relationship through sensation, what's happening in the present. Looking around the room, orienting, seeing what's actually happening right now. The gateway is the present, sensations in the present. Working with practitioner skills, 
especially the very first first category of skill is working with the presence, ground of being. Center ground in neutral, feeling your seat, your feet, and your breath. And then what is your body making contact with? What are the qualities of the things that you're making contact with? Are they warm? Are they smooth? Are they bumpy? What things help you feel here? And what happens in your body when you notice? This is a picture from this woman, Heidi Hansen. Uh, she um, had chronic illness and developed workbooks and really amusing and nice, amazing pictures. Um, I, I really want to give her a shout because uh, she said I could use her pictures, but they really are wonderful. And so I really recommend that if you can Google her, go to her her website, because I ordered some of her posters. Um, she's great. So then slowing down and noticing what helps you in the present, the next st step is stabilizing. And many people will come in their incoherent states and things that are influencing them are higher levels of distress. And you want to stable stabilize. So I'm really helping them feel that something's okay. Something's even, you know, maybe not good because something's not good, but what's okay. And helping them anchor into something that feels stable or secure or stronger. Like where in your body do you feel more stable? More, more here? Where in your body do you have a place that feels good or even okay? And you allow it to build. Um, Anna Chitty calls it the oxytocin bath. You want to create like this sense of, you want to get your person to get in sync with you. And just, will you try this? Just try feeling something that you is pleasurable for you or something that helps. What helps? And a lot of people are coming because nothing's helped. Um, you want to, in the very sort of smallest way, start to find your way in. What what helps? What so what makes it better? Um, and if they can't go to something in their life, you can start with the present in your office. And you can find something in the room that's pleasurable for them and what happens when they see it. You can feel, have their body touch what their body is touching. And I also use a, a touch sequence, deeper touch into the legs to help them feel their structure. Another way you can help someone stabilize is creating that relationship that's not too close and not too far, just right. And you're there really meeting them, but not going into them, meeting them. What is it that they want for themselves? Um, and it can be touch, done with touch as well. So in stabilization, we can orient to things just in our daily life, the earth, something in there. Like sometimes I'll ask someone really simple questions like, is there a place in your life, like in your house or even your car that you love? I don't know how many of you really love your the inside of your car, but when I was a young woman in distress, my car was a place I could go and cry. So, I mean, you're trying to find things like that in people's lives. And orienting to things that are always there, like gravity, or the sky, or the ocean, and feeling our bones, and really appreciating our, our, our legs are working, our feet are working, our hands are working. You can try to stabilize someone through these um, moments in the now. And then from there, we can begin to come up against states that are more challenging. These are themes for safety and regulation. They're based on the work of Stephen Porges. Um, when I'm working with someone, I try and help to bring them into relationship with these themes of choice. Like often people feel like they don't have choice. Um, so to try to help them feel their own authenticity their own authentic impulse, or what are their preferences, and help them feel like it's really okay for them to have preferences. Um, help them feel what, what in connection, do they, where they feel good or better or safe even. 
I don't use the word safe very often, um, but it is how we create safety when we're a baby. It's our connection with our parent that helps us feel safe. Um, so our relationships play a role in our biology. And, and I use this quote, I am because we are Ubuntu or Dan Siegel's or we are a me and a we, a we. Um, and then polyvagal theory, this is neuroception. We're always looking for danger. So we have anatomy that does that naturally. So the next step is really working with inquiry and facilitation. And this is where the skills come in. This is as practitioner, what you learn. And some of you already have these skills, um, but there's a, a combination of presence and recognition of states and then bringing your curiosity. That's often your combination of presence and curiosity that can bring, bring about state change. And then your mastery of question, the open unended question, what happens when I say that? What do you notice in your body? Or what do you notice? What's your experience just now? And, and, and where is it in your body? Can you feel it? If you can't feel your body, how is it to feel what's on your body or around your body? And does it have a temperature or a texture? Sometimes people will ask, does it have a color? You're using a level of inquiry to help people become more curious about what's happening for them. And it's that quality of presence and curiosity that is most important. So the next step is just really the recognition part. And for those of you who come to the three lecture series, I have a pretty extensive map in lecture three um, around what I call blueprint and imprint possibilities. So Ray Castellino taught about this exquisitely. Um, he, he brought such a wonderful change in pre and perinatal psychology. He called it somatic psychology. And he began to be able to lay out all the layers of someone's experience, starting preconception. So his training, which I really highly recommend, um, it really looks at starting preconception with attachment, and but it looks at so many different patterns. And that's why it's really wonderful for you to be in a training because you'll be able to come up against so many patterns. You'll become up, be familiar because you'll have a cohort of people you're going through the training with. So they start in the ancestors. There's these prenatal issues. It can be, you know, how, where we wanted, um, doing our parents, what was going on for our parents when I when I was conceived, um, what, what was happening in the womb, um, what are things happening prenatally or in the mother's body. Um, there, there are chemical and surgical imprints. There are things that happen. That, you know, there's there could be even the environment that our parent is in, um, the water that they drank. I remember one woman came to me. I was at a conference and she said, well, I want to talk with you. I haven't been able to conceive very easily, nor have my sisters. So I sat with her and we did a level of inquiry and I talked, I asked about her mother and then I asked about her grandmother. And it turns out her grandmother grew up in an oil field. It's quite likely that there were some neurobiological agents there that disrupted the sequence of fertility in this family, all from living in the one specific area. So you begin to develop skills of inquiry and recognition like that. Um, there can be uh, difficult births, there can be surgical births, and difficult births aren't always interventions. They can be long births or stalled births or uh, very fast births or births that had, you know, a lot of what we call prodromal labor, which is weeks of contractions and the mother is stressed. And there's these binds, what we call double binds. Um, these are the most difficult patterns, but they're the most prevalent in working with earliest layers of difficulty. We used to laugh and just say, well, maybe we should just call ourselves double bind practitioners because we work so often with these patterns of the bind. 
And then there are these family dynamics, like I've told you, the long-term formative sequence that influences our nervous system for years. So pre and perinatal somatic psychology is a somatic pattern language. Starts preconcep preconception, and there's lots and lots of patterns. And there are ancestral ghosts, ancestral strengths, the parents' relationship. Um, what happened for us at conception, where we a wanted baby, and all the birth experiences and things that happen after birth. So we're navigating these really significant layers. Often they show up and then they're stacked. And then they become compressed because nobody is naming and they're, they lay there unaddressed. And so it becomes part of our job uh, as practitioner to be able to name the layers for someone. And someone times just by naming the layers and spending time there, slowing the pace, having the person that we're with really get it, that we get it, things began to integrate. It's like creating a coherent narrative with somebody, but with them from the inside out. So when working with adults, we address these layers of experience. These layers shape our foundation, right? This layer along with many other layers, that's what shapes us. So what I love about going back to the embryo is that when you can find someone who can really feel that early sovereignty, the magic of how we make our body, that is often a beautiful starting place. Um, because I, I feel like the memory of that can be enough to help change how we come into relationship um, with all these other formative forces. So we identified our early layers based on the history, the felt sense, and the story. So the last important theme is memory, presence, and shifting states. So that these implicit memories, they are alive and looping, like they, they loop. They, they don't ever find a way to land and settle. So part of our job is to help name things. And often when the person across from you, when you hit the right thing, and you, you know, could be as practitioner and it starts to land and settle, suddenly their nervous system shifts. So with practice and training, you begin, can begin to get to know the patterns. That's why I've named, I've laid out these maps. And I'll teach them to you um, in, if, when you come to the, the other lectures. And I begin to try and liken it to weaving. You can be, start to weave. You can begin to identify the pattern, the state, the things that have happened, the skills necessary. And then you use your practitioner skills, slowing the pace, building relationship, listening well. And as, and as you weave, you're weaving, the person in front of you begins, their life begins to make more sense. So you use these skills, presence, recognition of state, slowing the pace, pausing. And then you have to sometimes and often work to shift the state. So um, Ray called this the leading edge. Um, Jim File calls it the, um, the bodying process. In somatic experiencing, it is really all the skills that Peter Levine teaches around recognition of what happens um, when you have a state, a fixed state. Um, he called it pendulation and titration. But long ago, John Titty taught me that often what happens, why people come in to see you is that they have a fixed state, a state that's bothering them, a state that's um, where it's, it's either high arousal or a combination of arousal and collapse. They can't seem to manage their lives. And so you help people by identifying the state. And then you can very subtly come up against the, the edge of it. Can you feel it? What happens in your body? Does it have a shape? You learn to have a different level of inquiry with someone. 
through their body, through somatics, through sensation. And then you move them towards something challenging and then away from it and then back towards something challenging and it starts to get a decrease in its intensity. It starts to disassemble and integrate into their lives. And the body does it naturally if you, once you start the pendulum swinging because the body is a polarity. The body can do it. The body has its own natural capacity which I feel like that's what's often ignored in psychotherapy and other mental health. The body has a magic to it all on its own. And once you get the pendulum swinging, it will continue to do it. So I wanted, to, I wanted us to practice a little before we complete tonight. Let's practice. So we're going to shift a state. I'm going to teach you how to do it from a technique that... Um, John and Anna Chitty taught me. It's called Body Low, Slow Loop. But it's basically this. I'm going to talk you through it in a minute. But it's around what happens in your body. I'm going to ask you to do a body scan and find a place that feels a little tense or just a state that you notice. And draw a dotted line around it and notice how it is. And then you can shift to another place in the body which I'm going to do with you. I'm going to do hands and feet and spend time there. And then you shift back and just see how it is. So this is the script. I'm going to stop um, sharing and talk you through it. You have it in your notes. Um, so you can practice this with others. And um, it actually, there's a recording of it. Um, on uh, John Chitty's website as well, energyschool.com. And when I first met John and he was really teaching me this, I used to listen to that recording a lot. <laughs> um, so here, I'm going to talk you through it. So before I do that, are there any questions? Does the magnetic field can be experienced in the same way as a person during, oh yes. We do this through Zoom all the time. And how to work with people with illness. Depends on the illness. Maybe the person who asked that question, Ronnie, we can talk at the end and give me an example. Uh, Allison, can BCST sessions be one way to help people to experience their embryo embryological sovereignty? Or is it a more direct approach that's often needed? It, I would say it depends on the practitioner, Allison. Um, I would say um, some practitioners, yes. Especially if you know what that feels like. Me personally, I have found my I remade my body doing embryological qigong, embryo qi, with um, Bob Lenberg through the online school. And then I do qigong, um, but I combine it with an education about what is actually happening in the embryological sequence. Or you can take Yap van der Waal's course on embryo and us. That's an excellent course. Excellent. Magic. Magic. He shows you all the magic of how we make our body, and it's it's beautiful. And I tr I that I trust the body so much, so I I, I want to invite people to really trust it. I think that's what's hard is that we don't trust our body. Um, many people feel betrayed by their body, or they're not taught to come in contact with their body. But um, I find, I find that the that that the body, the body can actually once you get the pendulum swinging, it will start. So I'll give you an experience of that now. Um, yeah, the, the the course is called the Embryo and Us. It's Yap van der Waal. Um, if someone want to put uh, Yap? We want to put your website in the chat. Um, and we're going to have Yap on the online school here this coming year, but he teaches in many places around Europe and 
It's really excellent. I have recordings of it in the online school. And was there one more question? Good resources for double binds. Well, now, there aren't many good resources. There's Gregory Bateson. He's the one that created the original idea. I think Ray Castellino was one of the people that brought uh, the beauty of understanding the impact of the bind. And in my Patreon page, I have quite a few blogs about the bind. You can find them there. Um, but we're, we've, for people who are trained by Ray we'll, and by myself, we have now advanced modules in understanding tracking subtle skills uh, and developing bind skills, working with the bind. And we have three advanced modules, and there's actually three or four protocols that Ray taught that we're going to be helping people understand and the application to the modern birth setting. The binds, um, binds are the hardest, and it's usually the stuck place. It's a stuck place that loops and doesn't end, and it's a never-ending painful place um, that you just can't seem to help people, and I feel like Ray's work with the binds, I mean, even having a name for it is uh, helpful. But I um, I have a Patreon page called A More Beautiful Life, um, and I have quite a few um, blogs in there about working with binds. Okay, so this is the almost to the end of my time with you. And um, I just want to walk you through this very simple pendulation exercise. And it actually can really help if you're having a, a, a pain or a tension or even an emotional state. Because often if you're having an emotion, you'll probably have something in your body. So just take a moment and just feel your seat and your feet and your breath, just feeling the present. And just take a moment and just do a body scan. I'm going to talk about what I find in my body. I invite you to find something in your body. So just do a little body scan and notice any areas of tension or discomfort. And I think my whole sort of viscera, like my visceral cavity, I feel tense there, probably from gearing up to talk with but talk with you and do this presentation, even though I love doing it. <laughs> um, yeah, so just in yourself, find an area of tension and just draw a little dotted line around it. See if you can get a sense of the shape of it. When I'm work, when I'm talking somebody through this, I say, "Is, is it a circle or a square? Um, is it is it does it have a shape?" You know, even while I'm talking with you, I can feel the state is changing. Yeah, so mine was a circle, sort of irregular, and you just come to the edge of it and just notice. Does it have a temperature? Um, it's about the same as everything else. So I have a texture. Yeah, it's a little scratchy. Is, is it on the surface or is it deep? Yeah, mine's really just on the surface. And then shift your attention away from that area and come down to your feet. And just notice your feet on the floor. If you're just sitting cross-legged, just notice your feet. And I advise you just to put them on the floor if they're not. And just notice what you're making contact with. And just really feel if you're wearing a sock or a shoe, or if you're barefoot, just notice what your feet are feeling. Like notice what it, the, what it feels like. Is it smooth? Is it warm? Is it cool? If I'm wearing slippers. I can really feel the, how the slipper is around my foot. And then just take a moment and count each toe one at a time. Sometimes I try to just 
move my toe a little bit, counting them. And then pick one foot and imagine that you have a pencil on the end of a stick and reach down in your mind's eye and just trace your foot onto the floor. Let's move your pencil along your foot as if you're tracing it onto the floor. And go all the way around, all the way around the heel, all the way around the foot, go around twice. And then now come back up and notice the state that you had originally noticed before. And just notice, has, has there been any change? Does anyone have a report? Did you notice a change? Yeah? My stomach totally is so different. It's really open, a little more. It's like a little bell ringing in the sky that, in my belly there. It's a little ringing. It's nice. Anybody else have a report they'd like to share? I'm going to teach you how to do it with your hands. Yes, Vicky. No, you, I can't. I can't hear you. And well, second time round, the foot got bigger, and then integrated with the leg and the whole body. Hmm. So that, yeah, the whole body expanded out of the foot. Yes. Good. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to teach you how to use your hands. And the, the hands are, I think, even more expressive on this exercise than the feet. Um, I feel like uh, putting your hands now on your legs and just move your hands back and forth over the material that you're wearing. And if you're not wearing anything on your legs, just find something to that your hands can touch. Usually people are wearing shorts or pants or a dress or skirt. And see if you can just feel how the threads are moving in your clothes. And I even like lifting my hands up a little bit and using my fingertips, which are very sensitive. There's a lot of nerve endings there. And see if you can feel the swirl of your fingerprint. And just be curious. Imagine that you can. Feel the ridges of your individual print. And then take a moment and just count each finger one at a time. I, I kind of like to push it into my leg a little bit. And then take, take a finger of one hand and trace the other hand onto your leg. And just move your finger along. up and down, around the fingers, and all the way around the hand. Go around twice. And then shift your attention back to the area of tension in your body. And then just notice if there's been any change. How about, how was that for you? What did you like better, the foot or the hand? Anybody? I'd like to say something. Ronnie? Say yeah. So, um, wow. Wow. Um, I have an illness now, a very difficult illness from mold uh -huh. and from, um, and now chemical sensitivity. My life is very limited. And I live in a home where my son his, and grandkids have disowned me even here. So a lot going on negatively. And I may be in touch with you because I'm also 
clear about my early childhood stuff and my birth and everything mm -hmm. and the whole thing of safety. And now, of course, I'm not safe. But how this is, when I, yes, there's like, oh, my God. It's an oh, my God time. But I appreciate you. And I've been a therapist and I've been everything else. So this, and, and a, a, body, a dance therapist, a movement therapist, a body person, the whole thing. So this is not an easy thing for me. But so I did the exercise with the hand. I didn't do the foot. I was like, I don't want to do anything now, blah, blah, blah. But I came back and I did the hand. Um, so I'm smiling because I found myself again, which I haven't done in a while. Because by doing that on the fabric, and I, I'm allergic to clothing now. I can only wear um, natural cotton unbleached. So I was doing it. And what I experienced was the spiral my spiral oh. in touching the fabric it felt like i was in touch with the spiral again which is such a a rich part of myself oh good and um so i'm smiling <laughs> and that was good to find that i found that afterwards tracing the hand it was almost too much to take that um the exercise even more i was still savoring the spiral but anyway Oh, good. I live in New York, by the way, and I wanted to find out more about the training you're doing in New York. So I'll email you or something. Yes, so, please do. Okay, thank you. Thank oh, you. For yeah. Thank you, Ronnie. Okay. So I'm I'm just have a few more slides at the end of my slideshow, and then I'd like to open it up for questions. Um. Okay. So I in the three classes that I've I'm about to to teach starting on the 22nd of January I'm going to introduce the three maps that I use. And like I said it's a weave, it's a bit of a weave to understand all the different things that can show up when you're working with earliest layers of experience. So I, I introduce the physiology of trauma, really understanding the autonomic nervous system. And um, I ask that practitioners become fluent in understanding the autonomic nervous system responses. The second map are these five distinct experiential layers. And they include the health in the system, which is what we're trained to look for first, shock traumas, which somatic experiencing is really good at understanding that our body will often, um, when we're working with a shock, will often have their natural normal threat responses thwarted. So you want to restore that. We work to restore a natural, the natural normal defensive gestures. And those can show up in birth as well. Then there's developmental trauma, which is those... That's the early childhood, but also it can be a lifelong family dynamic. Um, and it has lots of names now, which has been so interesting to watch it develop over time. Developmental trauma, complex trauma. I'm really understanding that these experiences that we have in our families create developmental, like a developmental issues. And many of us, if not most of us, have developmental needs that didn't get met. So part of us, what we do is identify that. And that can come up at birth also. When we're working with families, the adults often have their earliest layers show up here. But then there's the deeper mysteries. Those are two more layers which we treat, which I teach in pre and perinatal work. They include the embryo. And they include how we come into form, our elemental nature. And what I love about teaching pre and perinatal work and understanding it is our deepest spiritual experiences are right next to these early layers. So often as we integrate these early earliest layers, our, our more true nature, our essential nature emerges. And these are states of compassion and generosity, determination, strength, delight, joy, all these states can often come to the surface then. 
because they're so coupled with this early time. So I teach about those five layers and how our essential nature, our health, often gets bound up and becomes the imprint. They're connected. And that's the work of Anna Chitty. She taught me that. And then I, the third map is a, what I call a living map. It's a map that I continue to add to. And it, it is all the layers of experience starting preconception. And they include, you know, how it is, or, uh, how or what happened at conception. If we were wanted, if, uh, if, if we, enduring discovery with how that was for us, our implantation even can have distinct layers of experience. Um, then what happens in utero, how we develop, how we make our body there. And then what happens at the end of pregnancy, um, then how it is that we are born. There is a distinct sequence there. And then what happens after birth. That map is fairly long. And it has blueprint and imprint possibilities linked to it. And I sort of give a presentation that day of what some of the things around early childhood, some of the things that we that should have experienced that we didn't, many of us didn't. We have a developmental sequence that we went through where our developmental needs weren't met. Um, so I talk a little bit about that. Those are the three maps, um, but I want to also give a shout out for the best pre and perinatal healing practices. Um, birth process workshops, private practitioner settings. Um, and you can find people in the online school that do all that in the prenatal and perinatal somatic collective. This is a group of practitioners who are highly trained to work with uh, pre and perinatal layers of experience. And then I wanna say, please, if you're interested in this, I recommend formal trainings. Um, group experiences, practices, and really when you are in these trainings, you get to meet other people that have different, a different constellation of experiences than you. It will add to your development and to your expertise. And you will also make friends for life with people there. This is my training that I developed with my, um, my, my midwife partner, Lois. We work with understanding these autonomic nervous system trauma layers. Um, we create a, you know, field, a, a relational field dynamics. We help um, integrate how to understand working with, with birth dynamics from a midwifery perspective. Yeah. And we, un we also integrate the baby's experience. It's a new model of care that not only integrates the baby's experience, but the parent's early experience as well. Okay. That's, that's, that's the presentation for today. And I'll be sending out the recording. And I'm glad to take questions. I just want to thank you. It was very thorough. And you were very present. And so it's an appreciated thing. Thank you. Well, thank you, Ronnie. Eileen. Forgot where the mute button was. Uh -huh. um, uh, I was just wondering the the workshop that or whatever the, the next three modules that you're offering. I don't work with babies, just with adults, and so, but of course, you know, early experiences. So this, are you? Can you just talk a little bit about kind of like how that'll work? Well, the, there's there are three lectures. They're not really a workshop. It's it's mostly information for you. Um, I don't I don't know if I have too many experiences in those lectures. There's three of them. They start. Um, they're like it's like information a little, but it will give you a sense of the maps that I use. And it is working more with adults, not necessarily with babies. It's it's. We learned how to work with babies, at least I did, and many people, through working with adults. Mm. That's how um, the birth psychology field formed. 
um, people started doing rebirthing and regressive work and and then you know we we began to work with understanding birth dynamics by working with you know adult bodies and the nice part about that is the the adult can name things they can say what's happening in their body they can have gestures and actions they can name and talk and that's what ray was so good about really helping people slow the pace and then trust their body to find the, the way that their body wanted to go without the interventions and all the things. So the three lectures are, uh, they're about these maps I've developed. I think that I, I made them and I'm releasing them out into the world. I'm hoping that they will do good uh, mm -hmm. because I feel like there isn't enough information out there about these early layers. And a lot of times I encounter practitioners that really want to understand and maybe they can't make a training or maybe they can't go out to be with the Castellino group, which I highly recommend. Um, but I do feel like these, these maps will give you some information. And, and if you have a response to any of the information, that's information for you. That's where you go into like, well, contact one of our collective members and, if you feel like I'm telling your story, then contact me or one of our collective members and do your early work. Because what do you want for yourself on planet Earth with the time that you have left? So just come to the lecture or yeah. you can purchase it and watch it later. Yeah, I'm coming. All Thank right. you so much. Really sure. appreciate this. Yeah. It looks like I have some questions. All right, let's see. Is someone I, else? Yeah, hi, hi Suzanne. Suzanne, hi. hi. It, oh, it's such a pleasure to be here with you tonight. You know, you were my first instructor, and I just learned so much from you, and I continue to learn from you. And you have just been a gift to my life and to my clients too. You've really helped them move forward. So thank you so much. If anybody's questioning working, you you just been a delight to work with. So thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. Thank you. It's good to see you again. <laughs> you too. Uh, okay, let's see. Say more about how in shock trauma, the body's natural threat responses are inhibited. What might that look like? Collapse and shutdown? Well, yes and no. I mean, when the body, the, the body has a natural normal way that it wants to protect itself. And, and, and sometimes when things are very overwhelming, they will collapse and shut down, go into a sort of an immobilized state. Um, sometimes people fight. Um, Deb Dana ha says that, you know, she's another one of these polyvagal teachers. We all have a home away from home. Like when we're not feeling regulated and connected, if we start to get threatened in any way, we'll have a natural normal response. Some of us are more fight and flight, which is above and out of the range. A nervous system will speed up. Things will speed up. Anxious, frustrated, irritated, anger, you know, wanting to run, fight. And then sometimes when the nervous system can't take that anymore, it will collapse. And some people are just naturally normal. And they're more going toward dissociation, numb, collapse, shut down. And these are all normal, natural threat and stress responses. And that's where it's good to help somebody understand their natural, normal responses and not feel ashamed about it. Like, I'm a fighter. You know, I'm in my natural, normal state. If I get threatened, if I get stressed, I'm going to fight. Um, so, you know, it, it's taken me a while to understand that this is just my home away from home. It's not abnormal. <laughs> Many people have it. Um, a lot of people have the opposite too, where they sort of, sh they go numb. They don't say anything. They, sh they, they shut down. And then they'll come in and say, well, why didn't I say anything? Why didn't I fight back? Why didn't I tell that doctor I didn't want that episiotomy? Why didn't I say anything? I'm like, well, this is your body's natural, normal response. And, and let's work with it. I find that people that who sort of easily dissociate and become numb, it's a little harder to to catch 
and but the idea behind some of the therapies that I teach and the trainings is if you can catch yourself before you go into a conditioned response, if you want to change that response, that's the place to 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 pause. And then you can bring either, you know, more stimulation or less stimulation or have an action or two or or, or some inquiry or you can begin to shift the state. But uh, we have with shock trauma, a natural normal response, but in developmental trauma, we also have a natural normal response. So it takes a while. Um, yes, Ronnie? So that initial response would have to do also maybe with going back to one's um, early childhood or birth or something, yes. whether it's the fight or it's the closing in and then bringing up going from that into that early place can help you to um, to moderate or to modify some of your responses by understanding that. Yes. Yes, exactly. What are the stories I tell in there's a lecture series I have for sale. I have I I was born with a near death experience that put me in a never ending fight sequence. So I've been a fighter all my life. And so it's just taken me a while, but I've extinguished the fight. I still have all the the aliveness of it, but uh, I no longer have the fight, which which is a natural, normal impulse for me. But I lived that way for a long time. And that's where, you know, you can become aware of, like, why is this pattern so pervasive? Where did it come from? How can I shift the state if I want to shift it? These are all really good inquiries and something that we can help you with. So, let's see. Babies from drug-addicted mothers, do they have a confused state on all levels, including the inherent treatment plan? Um, well, it really depends. It depends on what the drug addiction is about. What, what are those chemical influences? But I feel like um, when I work with the embryo, I mean, my own embryo, um, there's a way that we can go back into that and repattern it. I would say it's, it's sometimes it's confusion, yes, because what is this thing that's coming in? This thing that uh, it's, it's numbing or it's stimulating or it's painful or it's toxic what is this thing coming in it is very confusing um so but it can also create a certain um, like a threat response for babies often their re responses are to shut down or dissociate but babies have fight responses too and they uh they did this they've done a lot of study of what happens for babies when their mothers imbibe alcohol for example or they smoke cigarettes and they've even shown how babies will will squeeze their umbilical cord um, mm -hmm. to prevent to prevent this toxic substance or they won't they won't ingest the amnion they won't open their mouth they'll become very still. Um, there's a, the book by D David Chamberlain has a chapter on that, which is Windows to the Womb. Um, there's a lot of research on how they've, they've seen how chemicals can impact babies. Um, but I, when I read your your little message, Vicki, I feel like the neonatal abstinence babies, um, I have the, the babies that, whose mothers are addicted to opioids, um, this is a very difficult state. It's a very difficult. And it's one of the things that I, I have in my training to talk about, like what, for, what parents that take that take those opioids and what happens for the babies. And yeah, I know. I think the inherent treatment plan um, is a part of the health in the system. And what we do is to help people find that health in their system. Um, even babies. Okay. 
Right, so it looks like we got to the end of the questions in the chat. Cicely? Sorry, I couldn't get my hand up in the That's chat. okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, my question is, is the foundation course a prerequisite or can one do the six uh, module um, pre and perinatal course that you offer? <clears throat> yeah, you can come and do the six modules. Yes. So the foundations course that I teach is a basic entry level course. And I've, I request everybody do that simply because um, you get a chance to dip into your own early history there. And maybe you don't want to do it because it's a lot. And maybe like I wouldn't want you to get into the full training and not want that. Maybe you want to come and just see how it is to be with me as I teach and get a sense of the somatic trauma work that you will be doing. Um, but I, I feel like uh, I, I like people to come and take that because on the third day, you do your own birth sequence. It's a little one. It's not a full womb surround, which Ray Castellino required people to do womb surround before they came to the training, just so they could know this is what you're getting into. Um, but I do have uh, basic building blocks I want you to know about that are prevalent in our training. And my language is the autonomic nervous system. So I want people to know how to shift the state and what I'm talking about when I say that. But I also want you to experience your own baby self. And I have found my own way of doing it. And I, I feel like I want you to be sure that this is what you want. So the foundations course is everyone has to take it. Yeah. And this could be done online as well, the foundations course. Yes, I have um, foundations courses hybrid out of New York City. There's one coming up at the end of, in fact, in, in about 10 days, 12 days up in New York City on the 25th to the 28th. That's a hybrid course. Mm -hmm. I have an online course that's in June that uh, anyone can take. And then I have another in-person course in March. And I have foundation courses in Australia as well. You can go to PPN Somatics and see yeah. all of that. Thank you very much, Kate. Thank you for coming today, Cicely. Pleasure. Somatics.com. This is my new website. What city am I in? I'm in um I'm in Charlottesville, Virginia. Which is near Washington, DC, about two and a half hours south of Washington, DC. Any more questions? Okay. So that's our evening tonight. Thank you for coming. I hope to see some of you come and really take av avail yourself of these maps I've created um, or come to a training or send me an email and ask, where can you go get trained? I'm a big fan of, of, of helping people find where they can go and delve into their own early experience. Thank you. Good night, everyone, or good day. <laughs> Thank you.